Welcome to l and Time, the show where we give you real information about real estate from the owners and managers who are in the driver's seat. And today we are very happy to have with us Stephanie Watkins from WPM Services. Stephanie, let me make sure I get this straight. 200 units you're managing about? Yes. 65% of them are rent stabilized? Yes. Mostly Brooklyn, some Bronx? Correct. Okay, and so Stephanie is here today so we can learn more about the manager as chameleon. Are you ready for that great topic, Stephanie? Yeah, I'm ready. Let's go. All right, so I'm Michelle Murata Witkowitz, and I'll be serving the tea. Okay, so Stephanie, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. All right, so now today's topic is the manager as chameleon, okay. which is kind of uh, 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 an enig enigmatic topic. So mm -hmm. I want to let the viewers know what we mean by using that broker story you told me before we got started. So okay. when you were a real estate broker back in the day, mm -hmm. you bought two cars, a Range Rover and a Subaru mm -hmm. Legacy. Why? <laughs> yes. Well, um, being as when I started off as an agent, um, I was told that you had to present yourself a certain way, uh, be professional, so I decided, hey, let me invest in my appearance. Let me invest in the vehicle. So I went out and got a Range Rover, bought expensive suits. I've always liked expensive shoes. So that was just an <laughs> excuse to shop. Um, so when I would present myself to sellers, they were OK. They, they didn't have a problem with it. I would give them the speech, how I'm going to market their property. They were good with it. Buyers, however, when I told them I would give them you know, representation and try to give them the best price, they were a little uneasy because now they focus more on my appearance. They focus more on the expensive shoes, the expensive car. You picked this up or things people said? Um, it was first, initially, I picked up the, the, the vibe, if you will. And then after getting a couple of people turning me down, represent them as a buyer's agent, I actually spoke to one last, uh, last potential client. And I said, hey, listen, why don't you give me some feedback? You know, tell me why you wouldn't choose me. And she just straight out said, you're going to rob me. And you I said, yeah. I said, why are you talking about it? She said, look at the car you drive. Look at how you dress. You're going to do something with the selling. You guys are going to like make the price go up. And I don't know how you guys pull it off. But no, no, no. You're, you're going to take too much money from me. So no, I so can't take it. you bought a Subaru. Yes. I took, that, I took that advice. You still have that car? Yes, I do. <laughs> I, I, I drive that car more now than, than the other one. So uh, with and that, that advice. And that made a difference. Absolutely, absolutely, it made buyer. a difference for the buyers. They they saw me as conservative, they saw me as someone that would fight for them. Um, they saw me with uh, the mindset of a savings, if you will. Now, so that story, that mm -hmm. those experiences, you carried mm -hmm. them over into management. Absolutely, absolutely. Now I want to give away one secret. Okay. Okay. So your company is WPM Services. Correct. And the W is Watkins. Correct. Which you're Watkins. Correct. It's your company. Correct. All right. So in general, mm -hmm. do tenants know that? No. So people no. think you're a worker in your company. Correct. And you own your company. Correct. That has managing 200 units. Correct. That's funny. <laughs> I, okay. So tell me about how you do interact with tenants. What's your um, recommendation there in general? My recommendation is uh, to be the employee, but more so just, just learn Learn your audience, learn your tenants. Um, I would say to any property manager, if you're getting started, um, or if you're just in the game right now, have a level of interaction with your tenants, but don't come off so aggressive or bossy because that automatically creates tension. So you're so it's better to not be the owner of the building or a principal in the managing agent and the managing company. It's best to be it, yeah. It's better to be perceived that way. Because what happens is, is when tenants believe that you are the owner mm -hmm. or you have some sort of stake in the building, they tend to come, they tend to be more aggressive. They tend to want. So you're more like an enemy, maybe. Yes. Landlord versus tenant. Yes, which is it becomes way a, yes. too much about their Automatically you become an enemy. Automatically in their mind because they think that you're looking at them as just someone that's just a tenant that should just pay their rent and do as they're told. They don't think you're going to listen to them. They don't think their problems you're concerned about. They, they, they just see you, like I said, as the enemy. 
So as an employee of a managing agent, mm -hmm. you can have a little more freedom to talk with people. Absolutely. Connect. Absolutely. And that helps. Oh, big time. Big time. 100%. I, I, don't, I don't get a lot of uh, uh, recourse back from tenants because the first thing they say to me is, hey, listen, I know you're not the owner. Yeah, but that's so funny. this is the problem that I'm having. I know you don't have any say so, but and I smile and you on have the other so. exactly. But I smile at the other end. But then now what happens is is you get a transparency. You know now the the tenant has trust in you. Now it's not to be used to be manipulative. Absolutely. I I I I'm thankful that they give me this trust. But what I do and, is and the way you keep it is obviously you don't violate it. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. But to get there, you just can't be the head person. Exactly. You can't walk in with the iron fist saying, mm -hmm. hey, I am woman, oh, hear me roar. That is such a good point. <laughs> but with the, okay, now when you go to the owners that you mm -hmm. work for or to get a new client, mm -hmm. then you're a different personality. Yeah, I'm the suit. I'm the owner now. I, I come in, you know, corporate, you know, if it's to. Numbers. Yes, numbers, spreadsheets, spreadsheets you know, budgets, you know, predictions. Right. This is what we can do. Yeah, so you're, now you're very rigid, you're very firm, you know, it's I can do this attitude. And so vendors. Yeah. Vendors, well, vendors are for yeah. your company. Yeah, your I'm the haggler. I'm the owner, but more now, now I'm the haggler. The yeah, yeah, yeah. I just think it's so ironic because in a world where mm -hmm. still to this day, mm -hmm. women are, you're fighting always to have people perceive you as, Mm -hmm. You know, I'm important. Mm -hmm. I'm the boss. I'm the owner. Mm -hmm. You are willing to just meet people. You're willing to put on whatever hat you have to put on to get the yeah. job done, which actually probably makes you more powerful. Absolutely. Absolutely. When, when, when people see that you are willing to work on their level, when you can work on someone's level, you have to understand your audience. That's, I, that's, that's so key. You have to understand who you're working with, who you're interacting with, and then work on that level. Doors will open up. So you're the same, Stephanie, no matter what happens. Oh, to the core. It's Le the same level of yes. excellence you're bringing to Yes, it. yes. But you just meet people where they are. and you. It seems like you're a listener. Yes, yes. You have to listen twice as much as you talk. You know, um, um, my mom always said, this is the reason why we have two ears and one mouth. <laughs> she did. She used to always say that. So it's, um, you know, you listen, you, you allow a person to talk because they're going to, you know, reveal to you certain things. And as you're listening, you pick up on these key points and then, you know, you put that in, in the back of your head and then you say to yourself, okay, this is how I need to maneuver. Um, look, look where we live in. We live in Manhattan. You know, there's, there's a million and one ways to get to 42nd street, you know, but if it's more advantageous for me to take a cab today, but maybe tomorrow it's the train, maybe tomorrow it's walking, you're still going to the same destination, but you're using different means to get there. And that's what so I would So whatever works, if the Pope's in town, you're not gonna take a cab. Right, exactly, exactly. So that's how you need to interact with your tenants, your vendors, you know, your owners, um, and whoever else. Mm -hmm. Stephanie, I can't thank you enough. This is really gonna be one of my best shows ever. Thank so. you for having me, I appreciate it. Okay, in today's legal segment, we're going to be continuing our exploration of how to make a healthy stipulation of settlement in housing court. So, the first concept I want to explore is it's important if the tenant is going to be promising to stick to a payment plan in the stipulation, that you put a line in that stipulation that says that any payment the tenant makes will be applied first to current rent as it comes due. This prevents the tenant from falling further behind as you go forward and it isolates that payment plan as, as to what the tenant really needs to concentrate on um, applying extra funds for. Also, repairs. Let's take the situation where no repairs are needed. I still want you to put something about repairs in the stip. You should say, tenant agrees at this time that no repairs are needed. If repairs are needed, here's what I really love to see. I love to see an actual date and time for access agreed to in court, not uh, tenant to provide access, landlord to inspect and repair as necessary. It's better if you nail down the access because access is what is always the sticky point in repairs. The tenant's always saying, well, he didn't come, and the landlord's always saying, I couldn't get access. So nail that down in the step. 
security deposit. Sometimes the security deposit gets chipped away at and lived down. That's really not a good policy in general. It shouldn't happen that way. Security is security. But if it does, it's really a stip is an opportunity. I look at a stip as an opportunity. So it's an opportunity to clarify this and say, this is how much of the security deposit is left. So at the end of the tenancy, that's not up in the air. Finally, I want to put this idea out there if there's a payment plan. Sometimes as a landlord, you're on the fence as to whether or not to give a tenant another chance. Um, and sometimes there, there's, there's a little trick you can use. If there's a parent out there, you can get a guarantor to the stipulation. Maybe you didn't get a guarantor to the lease, but you can get a guarantor to payments under a stipulation, and sometimes that's the thing that um, helps to get the deal done. So remember, guys, legal knowledge is real estate power.